government of God. The family of God. The practice of sealing to the fathers is to put together a family. The mother of John requested of Christ, Grant that these my two sons may sit, the one on your right hand and the other on your left, in your kingdom. And Christ replied, To sit on my right hand and on my left is for whom it is prepared of my father, but not mine to give. Matthew 10, paragraph 2. The purpose of organizing the family on earth through the sealing process is to make sure that one gets into the kingdom. Once one gets into the kingdom, then how the kingdom gets organized is entirely up to the Father. And that organization at the end is relevant to what will come thereafter. The government of God is not and never has been limited to an organizational structure. Instead, it hails back to things that were committed by God and promises made to the fathers that have yet to be fulfilled. It is not an organization of stakes, wards, districts, missions, or areas. Grace The free, unmerited love and favor of God. Grace is a gift, but the gift must be received. Only those willing to receive it merit grace, see TNC 86, paragraphs 4 to 5. It is received in the way the Lord ordained and in no other way. There is no space between faith in Christ and behavior evidencing that faith. There is no dichotomy between grace and works because it is by one's conduct that he or she merits grace. Christ received grace by the things he did. The manner by which each person receives grace is through keeping his commandments. See TNC 93, paragraph 7. Grace, or power to move closer to God, is also an increase of light. Light grows only as one moves closer to it. But man has choice, and he must elect to move closer to the light. If man receives the light from him, he receives grace, and he becomes more like him. He will be more gracious and patient with others. How was the Lord able to accomplish all he did? In Abraham 5, paragraph 4, the Lord explains, I am the Lord thy God, I am more intelligent than they all. He was more intelligent because he grew from grace to grace until he understood all things, because he had been through all things, he had descended below all things, and he had risen above all things, therefore he comprehends all things. Comprehension of the doctrine of Christ is not based on the command of a vocabulary or mastery of an argument. It is based on gathering light. Light is gathered by heed, obedience, and diligence alone. We consider that God has created man with a mind capable of instruction and a faculty which may be enlarged in proportion to the heed and diligence given to the light communicated from heaven to the intellect. By following the light one has received already, one grows in light, see TNC 36, paragraph 4. This process leads to the perfect day where the light has chased away all darkness. This is how all, like Christ, can grow from grace to grace until they also receive a fullness, see TNC 93, paragraph 7. As man keeps the commandments, he gains light and truth. Experience will be his guide. It works. If anyone finds this odd or difficult to grasp, he just needs to keep the commandments, and he will find it becoming increasingly easy to understand. Man will get light and truth as he follows the process. Do it and see it unfold. This is the way in which Christ grew from grace to grace. This is how he received the fullness. It is also the way man can get greater grace, greater light, and truth. It is the way man will obtain the fullness of light and truth. Moroni first asked Christ to give the Gentiles grace, see Ether 5, paragraph 7, but Christ could not promise it. Therefore, Moroni asked that the Gentiles seek for it. Moroni pled for the Latter-day Gentiles to seek grace. It is through grace one can obtain charity. It is through charity one can bless others. Great and Abominable Church 
Mankind is commanded to not unite with the great and abominable church. This is not a single congregation. It is the world itself. The entire world is divided into two. One is the church of the Lamb of God. The other is everything else. See 1 Nephi 3, paragraph 27. This is a bigger problem than it may first appear. Inasmuch as there are endless ways to belong to the great and abominable church, but only a single way to avoid it, the odds are Gentiles will not find Zion. Instead, they will fight against her, Zion, and join the worldly minions who are opposed to her. The abominable church is always ready to preach false, vain, and foolish doctrines to man. It will offer anything to distract people and keep them from seeing the Lord bring again Zion. It will even use the words of Zion to preach a false faith. It is abominable because its false teachings are clothed in the vocabulary of truth. Using a typological description, the prophet Nephi prophesied that the world, in the last days, will be separated into two divisions. There will be only two churches, or assemblages, or cultures, namely, the one is the church of the Lamb of God, and the other is the church of the devil. Wherefore, whoso belongeth not to the church of the Lamb of God belongeth to that great church which is the mother of abominations, and she is the whore of all the earth, 1 Nephi 3, paragraph 27. Therefore, based on what Nephi says, unless one is part of that body of believers whose father is Christ and who possess a covenant from him that they will be his, he belongs to the whore of all the earth, a church of abominations. Those who are believers are they whom he has declared to his father as having been true and faithful in all things. The other, all-inclusive, great church is comprised of all philosophies, all belief systems, all unbelief systems, all rationalizations, all theories, and all vanities that distract people from repenting and following Christ. These vary from very good things that are uplifting and possess even great portions of truth to the degrading and perverse. This all-inclusive church is a whore because she is completely indiscriminate and open for all to have her acceptance and affection. She welcomes all, the only requirement being that one have false beliefs. The great illusion of a whore is to imagine she likes you. To imagine she cares for you. To imagine she desires what you desire and is cooperating with you because she finds you attractive, appealing, and that you fulfill her longing. It is a lie, an illusion, and a fraud. Her bodily diseases are less virulent than her contamination of the soul. Empty, false, vain, and foolish thoughts occupy the imagination of those who have intercourse with the great whore. She prefers the lie, relies on it. You would not be her customer if not for the lies. This contrast is drawn for Nephi because these are two extremes. Both of them are religious. One is founded on a true religion, the other is a false religion. One follows the Father's covenants and will result in God's promised results. The other follows the commandments of men who have mingled their own philosophies with Scripture so that their doctrines are all corrupt. They share a vocabulary but nothing else. See also the glossary entries, Church. Babylon Great Knowledge and Greater Knowledge The man and woman who entered into the holy order were taught truths about the creation, heaven, and man's relationship to the universe. When Abraham was seeking to obtain what was given to Father Adam, he studied records that came down from the fathers. This included not just a chronology back to Adam, but also to the beginning of the creation, for the records have come into my hands, Abraham 2, paragraph 3. This is the knowledge that is conveyed to those who belong to the Holy Order. When the return of the original Holy Order is contemplated, it will involve restoring great knowledge that is hidden from the world. The fathers knew it would be restored in the last days. Joseph Smith also prophesied of its return and explained the forefathers of mankind anxiously anticipated its return. 
Abraham sought for the blessings of the fathers and the right whereunto I should be ordained to administer the same, having been myself a follower of righteousness, desiring also to be one who possessed great knowledge and to be a greater follower of righteousness, and to possess a greater knowledge, Abraham 1, paragraph 1. Knowledge is a critical component of the holy order. Rather than worldly status or rank, the holy order involves great knowledge from God. The greater knowledge of the holy order is the reason a man cannot be saved in ignorance. The knowledge Joseph Smith refers to is that same knowledge Abraham sought after. Its purpose is to allow the one who possesses it to become a greater follower of righteousness. Godly knowledge must be implemented to save one's soul. There is no salvation without obedience to the principles of righteousness learned. It is the same for everyone as it was for Abraham, to possess a greater knowledge and to be a father of many nations, a prince of peace, and desiring to receive instructions and to keep the commandments of God. In Abraham's case, he had both great knowledge and greater knowledge. Those are important words and were important parts of this gospel to which God made reference. If men are to be taught enough to have great knowledge, as Abraham had, then the information must be revealed from heaven. These words are like Abraham's words. Joseph Smith affirms he had great knowledge and sought for and obtained greater knowledge. The purpose of the coming last days temple in Zion is to allow the communication of great knowledge and greater knowledge and to restore what has been lost since the time of Adam. Important knowledge is required for those who receive the holy order. Man does not get saved in ignorance. Hades Hades, the Greek, or Sheol, the Hebrew, these two significations mean a world of spirits. Hades, Sheol, paradise, spirits in prison are all one. It is a world of spirits. Handmade. When Mary was visited by the angel Gabriel and told of her ministry to bear the Messiah, she responded, Behold the handmaid of the Lord. Be it unto me according to your word. Luke 1, paragraph 6. The term handmaid includes the possible meanings, wife, female partner, or consort. Mary was all of these to God the Father. When Mary said the words, he has regarded the low estate of his handmaiden, Luke 1, paragraph 8, the condescension of God seems to apply particularly for her. She laid aside glory to be here, and the father still held regard for his handmaiden in this low estate. What a great work our heavenly parents have undertaken for their children. Hardness of Heart Nephi gives a clear description, for Lehi truly spake many great things unto them which were hard to be understood save a man should inquire of the Lord. And they being hard in their hearts, therefore they did not look unto the Lord as they ought. And now I Nephi was grieved because of the hardness of their hearts, 1 Nephi 4, paragraph 1. And I said unto them, Have ye inquired of the Lord? And they said unto me, We have not. For the Lord maketh no such thing known unto us. Behold, I said unto them, How is it that ye do not keep the commandments of the Lord? How is it that ye will perish because of the hardness of your hearts? Do ye not remember the thing which the Lord hath said, If ye will not harden your hearts, and ask me in faith, believing that ye shall receive, with diligence and keeping my commandments, surely these things shall be made known unto you? 1 Nephi 4, Paragraph 2 Hardness of heart is usually accompanied by a hardness of head. That is, people tend to not be willing to live in accordance with principles, even though they want to know about them. They are often more curious than they are obedient, becoming voyeurs rather than visionaries. Oddly enough, one's curiosity gets satisfied as he obeys, but man is usually unwilling to make that exchange. Compare to Alma 9, paragraphs 3 and 10, and 1 Nephi 3, paragraph 26. Man determines whether he has a hard heart or an open heart. 
Anciently, the heart was considered the seat of understanding rather than emotion therefore, an open heart belonged to the seeker, the asker, the knocker on the door, see Matthew 3, paragraphs 42 and 44. See also the glossary entries, bowels. Broken heart, contrite spirit. Reigns. Hearts turn to the fathers. The phrase turning the hearts of the children to the fathers is a reference to the restoration of sealing authority, allowing a connection between man living on the earth and the fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. In this dispensation, that restoration occurred when Joseph Smith was given the sealing authority and priesthood whereby he could ask and receive answers. For behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud, yea, and all that do wickedly shall burn as stubble. For they that come shall burn them, said the Lord of hosts, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. And again, he quoted the fifth verse thus, Behold, I will reveal unto you the priesthood, by the hand of Elijah the prophet, before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. He also quoted the next verse differently, and he shall plant in the hearts of the children the promises made to the fathers, and the hearts of the children shall turn to their fathers. If it were not so, the whole earth would be utterly wasted at his coming. Joseph Smith History Part 3, Paragraph 4 Everything about this prophecy differs from present LDS teaching. The prophecy mentions Elijah and priesthood. Children get planted in their hearts because the children are living. But what is to be planted are the promises made to the fathers. Who are the referenced fathers? What promises were made? When were they made? Then Nephi speaks of children's hearts turned to their fathers. These prophecies lay at the very foundation of Zion, but traditions have taken away our understanding. The foundation of Zion requires re-establishing a connection between living children and those fathers to whom God made promises. There must be a welding link connecting the two. Contrary to the traditions, it does not involve connecting us to dead ancestors imprisoned in the spirit world. Our dead and imprisoned ancestors are in desperate need of our connection to the fathers in heaven. That connection is the only way our ministrations will help them. If all we do is to connect ourselves to our imprisoned dead, then we are tied to the damned, the dead, and the disembodied who look for a way to escape their fate. The fathers who are in heaven are the ones with whom we instead must form the link. Our salvation and the salvation of our kindred dead depend on it. The purpose behind these promises given the fathers and this prophecy given to Joseph by Nephi was to fix this problem. Because if it were not so, the whole world would be utterly wasted at his, and their, coming. The gulf which must be bridged through the work of Elijah to form a bond or connection, in the words of Joseph Smith, is not completed unless some group of people has been sealed to the fathers in heaven. Those there include Enoch City and Melchizedek City and extend further to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. See also, The Mission of Elijah Reconsidered, in Essays, Three Degrees. See also the glossary entry, The Fathers. Heavenly Gift An offer made directly from the Lord, often through a new gospel dispensation, with heaven's intent to bestow the fullness of the gospel and priesthood upon a generation. This fullness includes an expanding scriptural canon, revelation, heavenly visitors, and prophetic power, as well as all blessings and sealing power necessary for fullness of salvation and exaltation. It has been offered by the Lord more often than it has been welcomed and accepted by mankind. This is reflected in the Lord's lament, O ye people of the house of Israel, how oft have I gathered you as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and have nourished you. And again, how oft would I have gathered you as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, yea, O ye people of the house of Israel who have fallen. Yea, O ye people of the house of Israel, ye that dwell at Jerusalem as ye that have fallen, yea, 
How oft would I have gathered you as a hen gathereth her chickens, and ye would not? O ye house of Israel, whom I have spared, how oft will I gather you as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, if ye will repent and return unto me with full purpose of heart? But if not, O house of Israel, the places of your dwellings shall become desolate until the time of the fulfilling of the covenant to your fathers. 3 Nephi 4, paragraph 9. The Lord's offer can only be accepted on the condition of obedience and faith. When the fullness is accepted, people live in peace and happiness, and they had all things common among them therefore, there were not rich and poor, bond and free, but they were all made free and partakers of the heavenly gift, 4th Nephi 1, paragraph 1. He has shown himself unto the world, and glorified the name of the Father, and prepared a way that thereby others might be partakers of the heavenly gift, Ether 5, paragraph 2. When the fullness is refused, by mankind not complying with the conditions of the covenant, the opportunity to establish a heavenly order in Zion is lost. 